Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, the human experience is streaming live. My name is Xavier Katana. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. We've got a phenomenal program planned for you this evening. If you are looking for everywhere we are live, if you're looking for our full network, if you're if you have not joined the mailing list yet, or if you'd like to support the show, we survive on your contributions. Just simply go to allmylinks.com slash thehumanxp. Tonight, we are going to be looking at ancient civilizations. We're going to be talking about ancient archaeology. Could it be, could it be that the true history of humanity has been hidden from us? It's going to be a tremendous program. So please sit back. Grab a drink. And enjoy this conversation. The Human Experience is in session. My name is Xavier Katana. My guest for tonight is Mr. Hugh Newman. Hugh is a scientist, researcher, explorer, author, and a person who has dedicated his life to exploring the world and studying the ancient origins of the mysterious megalithic structures around the world. Hugh regularly lectures on these topics all across the world. His work has been featured on the History Channel, Ancient Aliens, BBC, Sky TV, and now the human experience. Hugh, it's such a pleasure. Welcome to HXP. Thanks so much. I appreciate being here. So Hugh, I mean, you've been doing this for so long, at least 20 years, and you know this, uh, this topic isn't so foreign to you know, this show, we've had Graham Hancock on the show, and I know that you've worked very closely with Graham. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I'm really curious to know, um, when did you, when did, I mean, let's paint a picture for our audience uh, at the, the scale of everything going on here. But when did you personally realize that, you know, mainstream history, mainstream science has been lying to us? You know, when did you sort of make the shift into studying this type of work? I got that kind of revelation uh, quite a long time ago, probably 20 or more years ago, when I started looking into the sacred landscape of Britain and around the world. I I was traveling. I started traveling around that time as well. And I realized there was a, a kind of subtle, invisible kind of aspect to these megalithic ancient sites pyramids and other sites as well and i felt that there was something going on i started feeling things at these sites and having experiences even um strange things would happen so i started looking into it and the crop circles occur here in britain as well and many of them kept appearing near these megalithic sites Mm -hmm. and i thought well how could this possibly be if these are for real how why would they choose these spots and so forth i started investigating the um, The fact that there were hidden geometries and there were earth energies, uh, invisible aspects, really, of these sites. And when I started dowsing and I bought uh, some equipment so I could uh, test 
magnetic and mm. uh, diff different types of readings at these sites, I realized there's something really going on here. And then science backs it up. There's research been done for hundreds of years, really, suggesting these are indeed energetic sites and they have earth energy lines and ley lines that connect them all up. And so that it was that angle I came in at, really. I came in from a very kind of really esoteric angle, if you like. I didn't come in from uh you know like a standard you know academic angle or anything like that so mm -hmm. and that's where I've, that's where i kind of maintained my sort of focus but got very, going into a few different subjects as the research led me there uh, obviously graham hancock was was an influence very big influence um and the worldwide aspect that he uncovered with especially with the archaeo astronomy but also john michel was a huge influence on me um he's a british author published about 20 books okay some classics like the view over atlantis and he he saw what you know what i was feeling he wrote about that back in the 60s and 70s um and, I, and that really blew my, my mind when i realized what he that he what he had been writing all these years and i and ended up meeting him founding a conference based on his research called megalithomania um and yeah and it really went from there and uh, since, since then i've got into all sorts of uh, very interesting shall we say subjects <laughs> yeah i mean i can only imagine i i feel like you know, so much of this and, and kudos to you for pushing forward against, you know, mainstream, because I feel like mainstream archaeology has hidden this from us for so many years. Uh, but something that you said in, in the intro there, I, I, you know, flagged for me, which was that, you know, you started having experiences that you couldn't explain. Yeah, let's get into that before we get into the sites and what, what were the experiences? Well, there's a few little things, actually, because I was going into a lot of crop circles, as you do in England. Uh, a lot of people do that. Um, and also, I was starting to meet people who could douse, like use dowsing rods and pendulums. And these weren't just kind of, you know, crazy people, you know, doing this. This was like a serious thing for them. It was a lifestyle. And it was uh, the actual, like, professional geomancers have been trained for years. That's been hereditary, passed from generation to generation and so forth. And so once you start sensing, how to pick up these energies um that's when it really got me i mean but even before that i had a couple of experiences I was, I was on st michael's mount for instance down in cornwall it's this kind of mountain in the sea with a, a huge kind of almost like a cathedral or a church on it mm -hmm. um and that's got a massive well-known crossing point of all these different energies st michael an apparition of him this light being has been seen there this angel they call him mm -hmm. uh, and, and i went there with my my brother emmanuel many years ago very long when i was like 17 or something i went down into the crypt and i had this outrageous experience of light just taking over me um and I, you know i could literally step out of this chamber then go back into it and i could feel it again you know step out it would be gone and so it was definitely you know like projecting down into this particular spot um and so that really moved me and got me and i didn't understand what was going on back then as only a few years later i realized this was a major energetic site hmm. had been revered for thousands of years um and there's major energy lines and crossing points and everything else going on there um and so that that kind of um when that kind of thing happens you realize something's going on um i mean there's there's one other th a couple of other things when i was in the subterranean chamber of the great pyramid in egypt this is back in 2012 actually on weirdly on december the 21st 2012 um we would, had a tour tour group out there we just had to go there um and and i was sick i got really sick extreme food poisoning and i went down but i just thought I'm gonna, i've got to go in i went down into the subterranean not, not the king's chamber or the queen's chamber the one underneath the pyramid deep underneath the earth mm. and when i got down there i was completely healed of my sickness that i had for about a week while only whilst i was in there when i came out there 30 minutes later the sickness came back and maintained itself for another week or two um so something in there was somehow neutralizing the sickness sure and what that was to this day i don't know but huh. so i've had different levels of experience I mean, there's a few other things that have happened as well uh, since and before then but you know when you you kind of start understanding that there's 
actual energy at these sites. This isn't just make believe. Sure. This isn't just wishful thinking. This is actually being recorded scientifically by people like John Burke, Philip Callahan, and other uh, excellent scientists and researchers. Um, there's something certainly going on with these sites, and this is what the really the megalithic sites are really where it seems to be happening. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's a little bit sub threshold, you know, for most people. They just don't know, you know. People know about the the Giza pyramids, and you know, but they don't really understand that. You know, the way that I like to think of it is that the pyramids in Giza are kind of like a ne- neural cortex, and it, it extends mm. out from there. But there are so many other sites all around the world, and. Yeah, I do think there is a resonance that is in, involved with this a frequency, a tone, ley lines. I mean, whatever you want. Maybe they're meridian points for the Earth. You know, we have them in our bodies, so you know, why not? Why not the Earth as well? Um, I'm I'm curious. Is there? You know, I, I'd like to, if we can, give our audience a picture of how immense this is. How immense a project like all of these structures would be to become an architect of you know so what is what is to you the most unique site that you've been to Uh, that's oh that's a that's a good question um i've been to quite a i've been to quite a few sites now over the years but i i I, I can't say i actually have a favorite this is a bit odd people often ask my favorite site the most important site, and i don't know i kind of get a sense that the more I ex- every time I go to a new site, that's my favorite site. I get so excited. I'm like a little child at Christmas, just going to look at a megalith in a field somewhere. Um, and this is where the name megalithomania comes from. You have a mania for visiting these megaliths. But the the grand scale of this is is not just Britain. It's not just the stone circles. It's not just the pyramids of Egypt, which are also megalithic because they're made of massive stones, major megalithic constructions. Mm-hmm. There's a global thing going on here, a sure. global network. Mm-hmm. And this was – there was communication. It must have been back then because many of these sites have the same style, the same geometry right. hidden within them. They have archaeoastronomical alignments, very specific ones all over the world. They have um, – energy associated with them with the same design principles in place geomantic and feng shui type design principles within the structures so somehow there was this very high knowledge that was being shared around the planet not just in one place around the entire planet and they were not just connecting these sites up with coded information within them but actually through a grid around the planet there's almost like they were aligning to each site all the way around the planet and all aligning to each other and it created what john michel my mentor called the enchantment of the landscape where he saw it from a very spiritual side but it was actually the scientific principles that made that sort of manifested this enchantment that everyone lived in and experienced it was like a golden age hmm. and it, when all these sites were functioning when they were energetically kind of uh functioning and working and that everything was correct they would have this effect not only drawing up energy from the earth and the underground water and the telluric currents all parts of the natural earth system but also at certain times of years when they were aligning to these solar lunar and other astronomical events they were charged up with cosmic energy as well. And people would celebrate and experience that as it happened. So these were devices, you know, for the spirit, really. And I think that's one way of looking at it. We also have other aspects we find, again, worldwide, like archaeoacoustics, where the science of sound and how it affects matter was incorporated into the design of these sites, almost almost entirely based upon the human voice so clearly they were designing them with acoustics and reverb you know and uh, different frequencies in mind and they were using the human voice to maintain this enchantment i believe all this energy around the planet and also very much in local areas as well i mean wow it's tremendous when you start to think about you know, the scale of operations that you would have to be at, you know, not only just moving these stones, these massive stones around, but then also replicating, you know, if you take a a civilization that is separated, not only geographically, but also, you know, through time by thousands of years, 
you and you notice that okay they're using the same building styles they're using the same sort of you know blueprint to build these 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 structures so I mean, what can we infer from this? We can infer, you know, that, that there could have been some sort of communication. Do you think that all of the builders were, you know, originated from, you know, the same kind of people or how, how does it work? That, that, that's a that's a good question. I mean, where where this originated from is is has been a tough question for a very long time, but the discovery of Gebekli Tepe in southeast Turkey mm. has opened up the possibility that indeed that was the area, southeast Turkey, the Bible lands, with these extremely ancient sites that go back twelve or so thousand years, uh, with very sophisticated uh, geometries, stone circle designs, beautiful uh, relief carvings, and so forth. So it seems seems like that is the current you know agenda that that's the origin point of what we, what we think now mm. but you know even at stonehenge for instance just as an example there's three giant wooden post holes were found that had pine almost like totem poles in them which could have been up to 30 feet high they're about three feet or, or one meter across and these are ten thousand years old which is about five or six thousand years older than the main stonehenge construction so they were marking the the position of Stonehenge 10,000 years ago, just at the time when Gebekli Tepe was coming to a close, suggesting there may have been a movement to this part of the world. And there's certainly some evidence to suggest that the origin point probably was the area, but we have other anomalies around the world which are extremely ancient, mm -hmm. uh, which don't add up. Uh, and some of these are contested. There's arguments about carbon dating and so forth. Mm -hmm. We have... Um, we have like the, the post holes at Stonehenge. We also have a submerged stone circle, semi stone circle off the coast of Israel, which is about 7,000 years old, called Adelid Yim. We have evidence in um, you know, a couple of other, a few other parts of the world that, that may be much older than people realize. And so this is really opening up the idea of sophisticated human beings at a much earlier date. Um, and they were obsessed by building with stone and like, you know, and what, I think one of the main reasons all these different sites were made is that they were made to last and they were there for multiple generations to utilize. So they had a practical purpose, I believe, not just a ceremonial or ritual, but actually um, they were generating this energy I believe, which has been now tested by John Burke and others, mm -hmm. uh, and it would it would charge up the seeds and the grains and other things like this, so they would guarantee fertility in their crops and also in their livestock and in themselves. You know, actually, it would enhance themselves. Wow. And so this is this is like you know this is major geomancy of the landscape and geomancy of uh, really the being and the spirit. And so this is what these people were doing and so that that i believe it seems at the moment even though there's potential evidence of earlier cultures that the area around gobekli tepe southeast turkey that's where they were most certainly doing it there because we know it's been carbon dated by german archaeologists it's definitely you know this old um and uh, the principles maintained themselves for somehow for thousands of years. Hmm, hmm. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's opened almost to interpretation until we find the next thing. And, you know, so it, it, it does seem that, you know, Gobleki Tepe, I'm butchering that, but, you know, that does seem, to, that area, Mesopotamia, does seem to be the hotbed of where all of this kind of popped off. But, you know, it, it does seem as well that, I don't know. Let's stick with let's let's stick with Globeki Tepe. There was yeah. there was some you went there and um, I, I think from what I read you you found that there were these carvings that uh, of of these statues that of these humans that are they're wearing these space aged belts and you you talk yes. about the pillars. I mean, what were some of the the features there that you found the most exciting? Gobekli Tepe is a very, very unusual place. Um, it's got these huge kind of pillars, these two central thin pillars in the center with a T-shaped top. Uh, and they're really anthropomorphic forms of humans. You can't see the facial features on the strange abstract design, but you can see the arms coming down the side with the hands touching the navel. 
and also a strange space age type belt with H's on them and also serpents and other creatures carved in 3D relief on these remarkable limestone pillars. And some of the stones are 24 feet tall and so it's an extremely uh, sophisticated, very megalithic site and there's, there's potentially many, maybe 30 or 40 of these stone enclosures which have these two main pillars in the centre but around them there's like an oval or a circle of stones usually with about 12 pillars again these are all t-shaped with beautiful carvings on them um and there's all sorts of uh, other features that um suggest a very high level of sophistication most of it was deliberately or in fact all of it was deliberately covered up you know when they decommissioned the site around ten thousand years ago they used it for about two or three thousand years whoever they were and they covered it up and like they they fixed it they kind of repaired it and then they put rubble in and then they covered it up completely and hid it like a time capsule to be discovered in the modern age we're in now and and i think that they did that for a reason because it was so important and it was such it was like the turning point in history of humanity you know when this was taking place Hmm. It's, it's tremendous. It's so fascinating. I mean, was there any sort of link that you found you know, before between these sites and other places that you thought, okay, there's there's some sort of a message in a bottle happening here, and it's pointing me in a direction that that you know I should look this way. For sure. Uh, well, most certainly the fact that they're stone circles is interesting. I've written a book about stone circles and I've looked into this and have been researching it for many years. That The fact is you find them there, that suddenly they emerge somehow in Britain and Europe around 3000 BC, 5000 years ago, which is strange. And then there were thousands of them everywhere within, a, within a, uh, literally 100 or 100, 200 years. Also, some of the carvings on the pillars at Gobekli Tepe are very odd they're like they're specifically designed uh stylistically designed uh creatures like critters animals uh foxes uh even dodos apparently um and many other creatures birds and other such things and if you go to i've traveled a lot to peru and bolivia over the years and there's a couple of sites there. In fact, there's more than a couple now. We, we found more around Lake Titicaca, which have exactly the same carvings, almost pr precisely identical. Some of them are even the same size. They look like they're designed by the same uh, designer, really, you know, like the architects were doing the same things. They have a similar type of stonework. Um, to other sites in the Middle East. But these sites around Lake Titicaca are only supposed to be about 2,000 years old rather than 12,000 years old. So what's going on here? Are they, in fact, much older? Are sites, you know, not being dated correctly? Mm -hmm. Is carbon date and faulty? There's a big issue about that going on at the moment. Um, and it does suggest that, you know, it's an incredible coincidence if it's not something else and so you know you have to kind of look at this this uh, i just let that name the sites if anyone wants to check this out there's a site called silustani kutimbo also you have pukara uh even tiwanaku and pumapunku have some elements of this um there's also chiripa as well and and some of the sites in the in the later inca times even have similar designs as well which may have been influenced by the earlier um uh, sites around Lake Titicaca. However, there is a strange discovery that was made that may link the Middle East with Peru and, this, and Bolivia, and this is called the Fuente Magna Bowl. Mm -hmm. This was found back in the 1950s around the shores of Lake Titicaca, and it's this big sandstone bowl, maybe three or four feet across. It's on display at the Gold Museum in La Paz, Bolivia, and that has Sumerian and Proto-Sumerian script you know, carved on this, which has obviously been around near Tiwanaku and Pumapuku for thousands of years. So, and it dates to a time of around 2700 to 2900, I think, BC. And so this is really intriguing. So whatever, you know, even if the dates are, don't match up with Gobekli Tepe, it proves there may be a connection mm -hmm. between the Middle East area, Gobekli Tepe area, and South America. If that's the case, then that is a major piece of news. But everyone claims it's a hoax, even though I've looked into, I've spoken to the people who's, you know, the family who discovered it. I've got friends out there and they say, no, it wasn't a hoax. It's been in the family since the 50s. If it was a hoax, why is no one pr 
profiting from this? Why is no one you know, writing about this? It seems like a genuine find. And uh, so you've got things like this going on that are completely ignored. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like the, the Banksy of ancient times, you know, just leaving something there for you to figure out. Uh, you know, it's, it's so amazing. And I've been sort of teasing this, you know, as uh, through this interview, but you and your book, the one that we're supposed to be talking about today, Giants on Record. I mean, this we talked about this in the pre-show, but you said that this was the book that you got the most pushback from in the mainstream. Oh, yeah. So, you know, how how can we kind of get an idea of why, where did these beings come from? Were they giants? And what kind of evidence did you find to lead you to this uh, conclusion or theory? Yes, the book Giants on Record, I must credit uh, my co-author Jim Vieira here because he's, he's worked very hard with me over the years uh, on, on some of our books. And I mean, a quick outline for people that I don't know about it is uh, called Giants on Record, uh, Giants on Record, America, America's Hidden History, Secrets in the Mounds and the Smithsonian Files. And it looks at over a thousand accounts of giant skeletons between seven foot and 18 feet tall discovered in the historical record in North America, uh, including academic journals and the Smithsonian's own files. Um, and mainly in the mound culture sites, really going back a few thousand years. And so this really was a fascinating subject because I'd kept in Britain, where I'm from, I kept finding all these giant legends and giant bones discovered near megalithic sites. And so I was getting very interested in the megalithic sites in New England and New York State up in America. There's many dolmens and megalithic chambers and other such structures, standing stones, even stone circles up there. Um, and then when I met Jim um, back, I think, in 2011, we kind of stumbled across the fact that there were many actual reports of giant bones and skeletons and skulls, even with double rows of teeth and things like this. And we found so many accounts. And there's a guy called Ross Hamilton, who's a brilliant author. He's our mentor. Mm -hmm. We call him the God, godfather of giantology. Um, and he is a remarkable guy. And so we started, we thought, well, let's do a book about this. He, Jim had done a ton of research. We've been doing this blog for years. Uh, I've got you know, I've been writing books for some time and we decided to put our heads together and put this book out. Whilst we were doing that, we got an offer to do a TV show called Search for the Lost Giants on the History Channel. Mm -hmm. So they kind of coincided the book and the TV show and we and it, it we got attacked when they both came out really, really heavily attacked because we were claiming that there were a race of giants in North America going back thousands of years, right up until a few hundred years ago. But we had the evidence from the academic journals. And so we were being attacked by academics, but it was from their universities that they dug up the bones and, re and reported and measured them. And so the Smithsonian is the main culprit of uh, disappearing most of these bones. Wow. But, but also um, you have NAGPRA, the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act, which came out in 1990, and that removed all the rest of the burial goods and bones from public display. But we have too much evidence to ignore. You know, reports, photographs, uh, evidence there on display, uh, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, we, we're now, you know, this, uh, we kind of jumped into that you know, back you know, five years ago. Now we're, we're doing actually a book about the British giants, and we've we want even more, even more information. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing. And there's really good evidence that there were these giants living in ancient times and there's been a massive global cover-up it sounds crazy it sounds like something out of some you know obscure bizarre tv program or something like this but actually it's not there's actually you know when this book comes out about britain people are going to see what we've been doing and, and what's actually there in the record if you know where to look sure. um and so yes yeah, so this is really intriguing and then you have all these stories and legends everywhere that talk about giants building certain megalithic sites and pyramids and other such things and almost every single place you research, you find evidence in that area of actual bones being found in very specific burials, almost like they were meant to be found to say, hey, it was us, we were doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and these were the guys who may have come from the Bible lands area originally, because there's in, even in the Old Testament, in the Book of Enoch, you know, there's a book of giants as well, going back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. They matter of factly talk about giants existing there and then as well. Um, and so there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. And there's a connection now with these megalithic sites because people have asked over and over again, well, how on earth do you move, you know, 80 ton stone? Sure. Well, you get you get you, you employ the giants to come and do it because they can manage it a lot better than us tiny human beings can. Um, and it, it sounds obscure. It sounds a bit 
out there, but it's just a, a chapter of human history that's been forgotten or erased. Erased, yes. And I think this is something that makes you want to research it even more. Yeah, I mean, wow, there's there's so much there, and you know, it's it's really tremendous. Do you think, do you think, Hugh, that uh, these giants were at the the apex of the species that that we don't know about? I mean, or were they like mid level kind of go do the grunt work for us? Well, I think there's a bit of both, actually. I mean, if you, I mean, I'm very, uh, I've been researching the early biblical text and other such things, um, and the book of giants that were found within the Dead Sea Scrolls and the book of Enoch, and that they're really the the best or some of the only really written evidence of what they were doing back then. Um, And there are, you know, if you look at those and you know, you can start applying that to reality rather than it all being fiction. There's some re- there's so many bits of reality, little snippets that have popped out over the decades, over the centuries that confirm certain things that occurred in these old texts. Mm-hmm. And some of them relating to the giants where now bones have been found, sites have been found that correspond to what's been written in these early texts. And you really have to, you know, you really have to question um you know what? What on earth is going on, and why is this covered up so much? It's, it's, it's just one of these, uh, yeah, it's just one of these crazy things you have to kind of keep looking at, and uh, you get more answers as you dig through. But there are accounts of giants, you know, the early waves of the so-called Anunnaki or Watchers mm-hmm. that came down mm-hmm. and landed on Mount Hermon, and they spread out, and eventually uh, they mated with human women who were a different race really that's that's the way they describe it Mm -hmm. and they gave birth to what are called the nephilim which were these monstrous giants who were more like the like you said they were like the worker giants they were like the others but the ones before that the so-called gregory or the watchers they were very intelligent and these were the ones who were working with the geometry the astronomy the earth energies the mathematics all the, the the invisible things we were talking about earlier and so there's a spread of this, you know, it's interesting that all this is happening potentially where Gebekli Tepe may have been. And so there may be a connection even with Gebekli Tepe with these biblical giants and the spread of this knowledge around the world. Wow. I mean, it's it's tremendous the the scale of the cover up that had to take place to systematically erase, you know, you know, line by line in our history. I mean, we should be privy to this knowledge and you know, it's part of who we are, right? So yeah. what would be the reason? Why? Why cover it up? Well, well I think it's I think it's an odd one really i mean it, it different cultures have different reasons for it i think but if you, if you if you look like we've done you can find it it's all there it's just not public it's just not you know fully on the internet it's in obscure books uh, old texts you know town histories and things like this these aren't available really i mean the problem is they're actually in academic journals that are published we have copies of them from the smithsonian for instance and so it's all there it's just a case of looking and kind of digging it out and putting it in a, a format that people can read and understand um and so you know part of it isn't really covered up it's just being forgotten about because there's not really any giants still existing as such um and so we just don't believe we, we see all these fairy tales and other such things but there is a there is most definitely a reality to this i mean in the in the Giants on Record book, we, we go into detail. We, we do a whole uh, chapter called the Smithsonian Files, and we investigate the whole timeline of cover up, who did it, when it happened. And it's a pretty compelling story. You know, it's a real kind of, you know, page turner when you get into it. You really, you know, we really went deep into the sure. old records, secret letters going on between the heads of the Smithsonian and other such things. <laughs> um, and so there, there were agendas at play back then. Like we have at that time, the mid, 18, mid to late 1800s, there were the agendas of evolution taking place. Right. Yeah. Uh, the Smithsonian were championing that. So, the fact you know and they was manifest destiny with the whole white man must remove the native americans take over their land right. try, trying to trying to claim they were savages which is ridiculous and there was so there were these you know racist kind of agendas in, in, in with the mix with evolution so when you keep finding 10 foot skeletons with 36 circum- inches circumference skull and other such things it doesn't fit with these theories you know suddenly there's these really elaborate geometric mound burial sites going on for miles they're not savages they were clearly advanced human beings who were extremely powerful very tall and they were like major shamanic rulers of north america and that didn't fit with what 
the white man wanted. So they had to kind of brush that under the carpet, bring in their agendas, stamp it out. And so even though there are 17 accounts of between seven and eight foot skeletons in the Smithsonian's own official annual reports from the late 1800s, they then claimed in 1930 or 36, perhaps, the, the head of the Smithsonian at the time, that giants are no more. They never existed all mistakes but then you actually look at their own books and they're in there and so so this is so there's most you know we've got blatant proof that they're you know, discrediting their own research and there must there must be in there for a cover-up huh. I mean, that's amazing. just america that's <laughs> yeah. just america <laughs> yeah i mean it's 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 really tremendous i i think there's so much to be uncovered and when you start to go down this rabbit hole i mean it just yeah, you said, you know, you get answers, but I feel like it's just more questions. You know, you just end up with more questions than answers. And it, it's, and you know, you just keep kind of uncovering more and more. You mentioned the Anunnaki, and, it, and I'm, I'm fascinated by this subject. Do you think, have you ever, you know, have you ever thought that maybe, I mean, since they're, all of this corresponds astrologically with so much, astronomically, I mean, could it be that these, huge structures were linking up somewhere off planet like I mean Mars maybe other parts of the solar system have you ever looked at that I've, I haven't looked at that so much personally but I'm aware of that that is a theory I know even Graham Hancock wrote a book called the Mars mystery um, uh, some years ago so he was convinced at the time that there were structures on Mars that kind of corresponded with those on Earth. And so, yeah, that is intriguing. I mean, obviously I'm involved in that the History Channel's Ancient Aliens, so people do ask me these kind of questions. But it's not something I would, you know, I don't know if there's a direct, you know, if these so-called, you know, structures found on the Moon and Mars are actually influenced by the Earth or the other way around. But there are anomalies there. I mean, in my Earth Grids book, I do look at some, <clears throat> strange geometric anomalies on planets that appear to be structures, even though they could well be natural forms that, you know, the planetary size objects would form into you know, certain uh, 3D geometries, you know, Archimedean and Platonic solids and so forth. But, um, but you know, I think there's, you know, I, I'm certainly open to the idea that there may, there may be a reality to this. Yeah, I mean, um, who who was the guy in Coral Castle? Ed something, Ed Lead something, and I mean, he was moving around. He's like this skinny guy, and he's moving around mm. these massive, you know, structures that that weigh, you know, multiple tons. And I think, I think if I remember my reading co correctly, he just said, "Oh well, you know, I just discovered the the secrets that the Egyptians were using, and I applied the same thing." And I, I was able to do this. Any theories about, you know, what, what that oh, is? Yeah, I mean, Edward Liscowning, I mean, that, that is a sort of five-foot Latvian guy uh, who's very slight. He wasn't very big or anything. And uh, he somehow built this 900 tons of limestone quarried from the, the beach area of Miami uh, and then moved, cut, and constructed some of the stones weighing like 80 tons. He had a revolving door, which was 75 tons or something, in a perfectly poised and balanced that a child could open with their finger. Um, and I've been there myself. I went there a few years ago, and it's absolutely amazing. He had no electricity, no power tools, no cranes or JCBs, anything like this. This was entirely one, and no one saw him work. He right. only worked at night. Um, and somehow, he, I believe, he was utilizing magnetic power and... Either he was incredibly powerful psychic, like a tele telekinetic, you know, moving stones with the mind, or he had somehow mastered just this very subtle kind of technique that has been completely forgotten. And I believe it's something to do with acoustics, magnetism and balance. It's always it's like finding the balance point. Uh, of something makes it completely lose its weight and i think these were aspects he actually wrote a book uh, that i picked up while i was there about um electric and mag electricity and magnetism how that could have been used to actually uh, possibly construct the site even though he didn't give it away even in his book oh man god I mean, it, it, it's really scratch makes you scratch your head i mean here's this guy moving around all these massive rocks he says you know he just kind of figured it out and you know we still can't kind of get to the bottom of you know how he did it and we just have no idea you know so 
yeah, I don't, I don't know what it could be. I mean, but you know, just going back to the the scale of all of this and the the network that's established. I mean, do do you think you, know, you said that you went down into uh, the the chamber at the at the lowest point? Um, you know, you know, what could you? What 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 is your you know idea of why they were building these structures? Why even you know do this in the first place? That's that's the big question. I mean, I, th- I think there's different answers for this. I, I, I run through a couple of three ideas uh, for you. I mean, one of them, I believe, was they were like an energy generator. Now, this sounds strange, but there were scientists and engineers just at the Great Pyramid, for instance, who are absolutely convinced these were major energy generators they were harnessing natural energies from the earth cosmic energy they were actually built on fault zones so you have seismic kind of energy coming up and being utilized and then being sent out from these structures along the alignments and also along the earth energy currents along the natural telluric currents as well um, and this is part of the enchantment of the landscape uh, theory as well and i think the same principles are at place in other sites around the world on a much smaller scale we have dolmens and these are like table megaliths that kind of translates that uh, and these are like two or three stones uprights with a table top big slab on top and these are all over the world. Like every country on the planet virtually has these particular, quite simple structures, often huge stones. I mean, there's one in New York, New York State, North Salem, called Balance Rock, which is actually a major dolmen. We actually filmed an Ancient Aliens episode there recently. And there's the thing about them on a much smaller scale than the pyramids, obviously, yeah, they've been tested. They're often built on magnetic anomalies, natural geological magnetic anomalies. And if you place seeds or grains in them, it charges them up in a certain way where it kind of increases. If you go and plant these things, it increases their yield, the strength and the size of the crops. Wow. So these were fertility generators. And so just that alone is a good enough reason uh, to utilize these sites. But when you come to things like Stonehenge, you come to things like the pyramids and Machu Picchu and major sites like these, they're not only displaying, showing off their artistic and architectural prowess, they're also encoding information for that time permanently. That's why they build with such large stones. So it can't be budged. It can't be destroyed. And they're, encoding i believe information and not but not just information as we know it actual kind of um almost like projections of information built into the crystalline structure Mm -hmm. like like a computer you know like you know you know almost intended and manifested into the stone so there's, there's aspects of that going on but and also they're repositories of knowledge if you look at it from another perspective and so they're showing in advanced mathematical skills uh navigation skills some of them the way they're oriented is extremely accurate north south east and west they're showing uh, mathematics geometry astronomical alignments They're utilizing the earth energies. And so they're saying, look, this is where we were at when we built these. And this is where you should be at. And, you know, this is you should maintain this. And so like the pyramids, for instance, even humanity goes through many, many thousands of years of, you know, going into like dark periods, dark ages and coming back out into more enlightened eras. They're still there and and, and they're always going to have that knowledge, whether the people know it or not. And in this current era, we're just starting to understand what is actually these sites are really about and the the level of the people who built them incidentally were our ancestors and so they were doing us a favor you know by kind of creating these sites and saying hey this is how we did it and you can still do it that way now you know if the push comes to shove and there's apocalyptic kind of scenarios the clues there how to survive because you're going to survive because you can enhance seeds and grains you can create energy with these sites if you know how and there's like a system in place. There could have even been an ancient internet encoded within the crystallized yeah, structure yeah. of these sites with all the ley line. You know, who knows? We don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, how is anybody in the future, 2,000 years, going to understand our internet if they don't have it? You know, right. it's, you know, little things like this. You know, it's just a mindset about what they were doing back then. But I believe they developed 
their psychic and telepathic and telekinetic skills to an extremely high level. They also had phenomenal memory techniques as well, like the Druids in Britain, for instance, who could record things in entire volumes and, and speak them out, you know, as well. And so there's many different aspects, but I think the ones I've just mentioned are, are the key, key, key points that, that I kind of look at when I'm looking at and researching these sites. I mean, it, it seems like, you know, these beings were up on information that we aren't even under, we haven't even gotten a chance to look at yet. And we're just starting to decode. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you said that you got a chance to look at uh, some of these sites with some, some uh, scientific instruments. What were your readings? What did you come up with? Well, we just, I was using a basic um, magnetometer, okay. a tri-field, tri-field magnetometer. Okay. They're used also by uh, paranormal researchers and ghost hunters and things like this because it measures very, very subtle fluctuations in the magnetic field, the electric field, uh, radiation and other such things. Um, and if you, you know, you can utilize them correctly, you can get interesting results. Uh, for instance, at Balance Rock, which is the, the massive dolmen in, in New York State, <clears throat> we were, I was there just a few months ago with David Childress. We were doing an ancient alien show and I took it with me hoping you know we, we get some result and we got remarkable fluctuations because I, kn I know it's on a magnetic anomaly and so these things work and they pick things up so you can detect magnetic anomalies you can t uh, detect fluctuations in the magnetic field and the field lines the energy lines that move through sites and john burke and Cadge halberg who wrote the book seed of knowledge stone of plenty it was published in 2005 did thousands of tests at hundreds of sites around the world um and using high level very expensive equipment and did it all very scientifically and recorded the data tested the seeds and grains after they'd been um charged and um and that th they proved it once and for all what you know dowsers and geomets have been saying for hundreds of years that indeed these sites uh, do uh, are designed to you know produce energy and to like you know use the natural energy features around there to produce more of it and so and that they, they they basically worked out this new lot this science that had been lost for thousands of years and i think you know some of these sites clearly still function even today and so this is if you can if you can like charge up grains and seeds and, and affect the fertility of the landscape you don't need gm crops anymore you don't need anything you just need to utilize these big stones and the structures that are all around us that were probably built for that purpose in the first place yeah, I mean, it seems like the the ruling class or the elite, you know, back in prehistoric times were some sort of superhuman. I mean, they, you know, super telekinetic and, you know, using this psychic energy to who knows, you know, maybe communicate from one part of the earth to another. But, you know, what happened to them? Uh, there's there's different flood myths, but, um, you know, Graham talks about how they get to a certain point of technological advancement. And then there's a massive flood. I mean, we hear legends about Atlantis. What What are your theories about what happened to some of these civilizations? That's a good point. Yeah, and it, it's certainly the case that yeah, you can, you're going to get cataclysms. There's many of these. There's I know Graham and others have talked about the Younger Dryas impact event, the effect that had. Uh, that was a good a long time ago, like 12, 11, 12,000 years ago. But there are other cataclysms that have happened we know ones that have occurred and affected britain there's been flooding when dogger land which was the land mass that connected england with europe kind of went under and around around six or seven thousand years ago there's also invasions as well i mean england specifically has been invaded britain especially so many times um around 2400 or so bc we had the beaker people they're called coming in from the iberian peninsula through europe and they were a powerful, kind of strongly built race who came in and kind of took over from the more milder um, Neolithic people and who were much shorter and slighter here in Britain. Um, and they were responsible for kind of eradicating that culture pretty much, you know, whether it was through violence and warfare or whether it was just through assimilation, we don't know really. It's very hard to tell. But there are movements, there are migrations and, uh, and cultures that are more powerful than us most certainly will take over. But there are there are strong 
chunks of evidence for major cataclysms happening throughout the historical and prehistoric periods. You know, the Younger Dryas, obviously, but you've got other ones that may have happened in theory of the Mediterranean, the island of Greece, uh, now called Santorini, which happened a few thousand years ago. We've had other sea level changes throughout Europe and the world, which have submerged and revealed islands and land masses uh, that would have called ge caused general flooding as well uh, you've got asteroids hitting you've got uh, a cataclysm even around Lake Titicaca in Bolivia and Peru where it looks like some of the sites they're like Tiwanaku and Pukapuka have been bludgeoned by a tidal wave coming off the lake um, and so you get very strange anomalies like this all, all over the world and so you know there's always these changes taking place one way or another hmm. It's really interesting. I mean, what was what was the American Genesis theory that you had? Well, that's a book by Jeffrey Goodman. Um, he wrote that back in the uh, 1980s. And I, I, I thoroughly agree. With he was an archaeologist. Uh, he compiled all the data, really, for this book. And he was suggesting that the genesis of humans going back, you know, hundreds of thousands of years was actually North America. It wasn't Africa or any other places. It was that's where it, that's where it all happened. And, you know, if you look, you know, if you start looking into that now, there's a new theory that's well, not relatively a few years old that speciation or growth, you know, of humanity around the world didn't just happen in one place it happened simultaneously in different parts of the world like hundreds of thousands of years ago perhaps even millions uh north america was one of these so his theories have now been corroborated by new science really you know now this isn't well-known information we feature it in our giants on record but we do a whole section on that in the final chapter where we look at that theory because you have all these stories these native american creation myths and stories that talk about this time where this actually happened, where humans kind of manifested from spirit into matter in North America and in other places. And, and, and that may be the reality. Even even the, if you read the original kind of Book of Enoch and the early you know books of the Bible, the same principles apply. These beings didn't come down on spaceships exactly. They're more described as just emerging slowly from the ether into hmm. these mountain tops, then coming down, integrating with society and building societies with their knowledge that they had from this otherworldly place. Almost, it's almost like the fairy realm, the elemental realm, almost like merging hmm. between these different worlds. And so there could be, you know, an aspect of that. And I think with American Genesis, for instance, he found, you know, just getting a bit more uh, academic scientific uh, aspect that, Indeed, he found human type skulls that were like Cro-Magnon man, which is like European technically. And they, you know, the so-called Cro-Magnons appeared in Europe 44,000 years ago. And no one knows where they came from. However, he found skulls and skeletons and artifacts that were Cro-Magnon, but they were like up to 70,000 years old. And so he suggests actually they came from America. So Europeans originally came from America. So this is, this is to me, this is a fascinating theory. Um, and there's evidences emerging that kind of backs this up and it's looking at things in, from a whole different perspective. It's amazing. I mean, I, I'd love to ask you about this. It was, is there anything in your research that involves the usage of psychedelics and these beings, these, these people? I think it was a cultural thing um, and it was accepted in all societies around the world if these psychedelics were available. You know, I think that it was it was seen as a sacrament. It was seen as um, like a magical food. It wasn't seen as a drug. It wasn't like termed illegal. There were probably children eating mushrooms with their dinner, you know, regularly. <laughs> um, and, you know, you just imagine, you know, you, you, you forage in for your mushrooms and you come back, you feed your whole family thinking they're just mushrooms. And next thing, they're all completely tripping out for six hours. And so, you know, they were part of our culture. They grow everywhere. All these different things do. And I believe that was where much of the inspiration probably came from, mm -hmm. you know, to build, to, you know, coming up with the mathematical formulas and ideas and inspirations and you know ways to kind of um uh enhance the brain chemistry you know and even these sites you know the, the energy we're talking about would enhance the brain you know so there's a mixture of working with these natural natural kind of psychedelics and sacraments and also it, they would maintain this kind of 
you know, enchantment into their brain chemistry through the placement of these sites and construction techniques mm. to enhance, to project it from these sites, not just across the landscape, but into them as well. And so there's these multiple different aspects. And one other thing that the ancients were doing were, you know, which is something that fascinates me, and I've, I've read a lot, lot about this, is um, they, were, they were ingesting something called white powder gold or monatomic gold. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is most certainly a reality when you start looking into it. And the work of Lawrence Gardner really opened this up in, in some of his uh, some of his books from the 90s. Um, and uh, and so, you know, this obsession with gold in ancient times may also be because they were trying to create this powdered alchemical form, which actually would enhance themselves, you know, make them live longer, uh, enhance their DNA, have healing properties, um, consciousness expansion properties. So that mixed with the sacraments and uh, the harmony being produced through the actual configuration of sacred sites and earth energies and telluric currents and so forth would create quite a remarkable what i believe then was called the golden age you know where people were living in this harmonic reality which is something we uh, should adhere to getting back to do you think here you know, we've got about eight minutes so i'd like to you know start to wrap this up soon but i mean do you think that where we are currently in current times could be linking up to I don't, I don't know, you know, like maybe a changing of the guard, maybe one of these cataclysms is around the corner, you know, maybe even the, the coronavirus, you know, is, is one of those things. It, it, does it relate to it, it could be. I mean, who knows if there weren't viruses like this in ancient times, you know, wiping out, you know, complete civilizations. Uh, it, it could be the case. I mean, there was um, I, I think there, there might be something coming i think people can feel that kind of brewing that people were just a little bit tired of all this kind of nonsense it's all like it's all very to me you know you just watch viva vendetta and you get a sense of everything that's being projected onto us from the media sure. and it's just tight it's just tiresome people are just bored of it they want to just like stop this rubbish you know there's enough to go around we can all work together we can like all do you know pretty much what we want you know we don't have to have all this stress and uh, control and terror everywhere we can uh, have a different reality and i think that you know if you look into the the reality and the cultures of these ancient people that they were living in a different reality to us they had this harmonious for, not, not all the time not, not all the time but they had times eras where they got to this point of like um like a perfect kind of society, much like what Plato would write about and so forth, where there's like this sort of idyllic kind of Atlantean ideal where everything's in harmony um, and there's all these structures and governments and democracies that can have things in a certain way where everyone wins. And why can't we just go back to the more platonic, you know, way of kind of addressing these? Because obviously those that are in power aren't looking out for our highest good <laughs> yeah. currently. For sure. I mean, Hugh, we've covered so much. Is there anything that I should have asked you that I that I didn't? Um, I, God, there's there's a no. I think I think you've covered quite covered quite a yeah. bit of ground there. To be <laughs> honest with you, uh, I think we've got into different things. But I do, you know, I just I just want to recommend to people. I mean, obviously, at the moment, you can't really go out much but uh is to just try and visit when you can try and visit these sacred sites uh, these ancient sites wherever you are in the world even in north america there's tens hundreds of thousands of mound sites native american mound sites you can just go and visit and it just looks like a mound like a mound of earth or it just looks like one standing stone you find in europe somewhere mm -hmm. but actually each of these sites may be significant you know i think they all are and they're part of this network and so they're probably designed by these ancient kind of, you know, priestly, astronomer, elite, whatever you want to call them. Um, and so I, I would imagine they've got something there for you to experience, you know, one way or another. So I just recommend that. And also, remember, these sites were built by your ancestors. They built by your relations, your family line built some of these. And if you've been in one place, you know, one area, one county or country, for, you know, several generations, multiple generations, they may have been, you know, there might, might even be legends that talk about this and what this was actually used for, because there's all these healing properties with these sites that are in legend, folklore. And, yeah, I just recommend that. And that's, that's one of the things, you know, I, I kind of kind of try and share as much as possible when I, when I take, uh, you know, individuals and groups out to these sites when we do when we do our expeditions and tours. 
Hugh, this flew by so much fun, so much information. Where can people go to you know, find your work? I know there's a YouTube channel that you run as well. How can people go and buy the book? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, basically the book, I've got, I just mentioned the books. There's one called Earth Grids. There's one called Stone Circles. These are both wooden books. Uh, they're small books, but very packed with information, and they're everywhere online, obviously. Also, we did this book called, I co-authored, called Megalith Studies in Stone, which has my Stone Circles book and multiple other books within it, which, again, is published by Wooden Books. Um, also, the Giants on Record is available all through Amazon and stores and so forth. And people, yeah, I mean, the YouTube channel is actually one of our uh, primary places because I make a huge amount of videos. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sort of video producer. Okay. Um, film all our travels to obscure places around the world. And we've got 800 videos up there people can watch. We also have all our conferences up on there as well. So people want to sit back and whilst you stay in for the next few weeks um you can actually just watch multiple conferences that we filmed that we organize as well called megalithomania mm -hmm. in glastonbury and also origins conference we organize in london and um and that's megalithomania uk that's just all up on youtube and the website is just megalithomania.co.uk and people can contact me through that perfect guys you heard it here folks i mean wow what an amazing interview my guest hugh newman one of his books is called Giants on Record, which he co-authored with Jim Vieira. You can go find his YouTube, uh, Hugh's YouTube channel, and there's a bunch of information on there. If you find this interesting, I mean, there's a lot more that I'm not sure we covered in depth enough. I think you guys will really love it. I highly recommend the book. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll be back for sure next week. Good night.